So I've watched your video against Paul Laverne. It's long, it's repetitious, but I'll attempt to answer your points. First of all, I want to talk about scripture. In order for extra biblical scripture to be considered by me, it must pass certain standards. For instance, I disallow pseudographical accounts written long after the death of the author it purports to be written by. These are forgeries and have to be considered deceitful and unworthy of consideration. The truth is, most pseudographical accounts were written to try to manufacture evidence to support theological positions and they have no actual truth in them. The homilies of Clement and the uh, Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs are both pseudographical. Forgeries. False. Therefore, your arguments using them are false. The homilies of Clement are not the true teachings of Peter, and that should be obvious to all when you share the account of Peter refusing to eat with unbaptized Gentiles in order to try to prove that Paul was wrong for rebuking Peter in Galatians. Since this is where we are, let's look at this first. You contend Paul should not have written about this event, yet for all you know, Peter agreed that the event should be shared because he was in the wrong and wanted others to avoid the same mistake. But beyond that, you claim Peter didn't eat with the unbaptized Gentiles, and you appealed to the homilies of Clement as proof of this. There are two problems with this. First, Peter was eating with Gentiles before the Jewish believers showed up in Galatians, which is why Paul took such an exception to his hypocrisy. Now. I said that the homilies of Clement should make it obvious that they weren't the true teachings of Peter by what you referenced. In the story you shared, Peter was denying Clement and his brother permission to eat with their mother until she was baptized. However, although she confessed Christ, he refused to baptize her until she fasted for a day to purify herself. Nowhere in the Bible did we ever see anything of this fashion. So according to Pseudo Clement, not only would Peter not eat with unbaptized Gentiles, but he wouldn't baptize them till they fasted? This account is actually contrary to every single biblical baptism that I know about. In your video, you call for correction if you're wrong, but you declare it isn't enough to say one feels this way or that way. It isn't enough for us to say we believe this or that. You want proof of whatever is said. This is not the standard you yourself adhere to through much of your video. For example, you attempt to dismiss Peter's endorsement of Paul in 2 Peter. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read it. Second Peter 3. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you. Also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, and which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of scriptures to their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. First and foremost, you say that this passage about Paul was added to the original text of Second Peter. There's no evidence of this, but you do try to create evidence. For one, you read the passage removing the mentions of Paul, claiming that it reads just as smoothly without it. But that doesn't prove a thing. Secondly, you claim Peter wouldn't have called Apostle Paul a brother because that would have been an insult, yet I disagree completely. Brother is certainly a term of endearment. Third, you claim Peter calling some of what Paul wrote difficult to understand is proof that he is a false prophet because God is not the author of confusion and he wouldn't allow Paul to write something difficult to understand. To this end, we need to remember that you claim that Peter taught there are falsehoods in the Bible meant to deceive people from the homilies of Clement, meaning God is the author of confusion, according to you. Of course, this is just further proof that the homilies are a fraud. Keep in mind, difficult to understand does not mean the same thing as confusion. You claim that Peter ought not to have called Paul's writing scripture uh, if the verses were legit, but the Greek word was graphe which easily could have meant other writings. And you declare Paul never wrote of Jesus' long suffering. So let's show you where Paul wrote about Jesus' patience for salvation. Romans 2, 4. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? Romans 9, 22. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? It's obvious you do not understand Paul, Peter, or even the Bible. 
You claim there is no evidence that God orchestrated the canon of the Bible, yet your attack on the Bible requires the burden of proof be put on you, not us. You reference Second Esdras to prove there are other inspired books of God not found in the Bible, but the other books Esdras referred to were to be kept secret. So while you proved Esdras wrote that there were more inspired writings not in the Bible, according to the account itself, they shouldn't be in the Bible. You tried to attack the Protestant Bible as being connected to the occult. But your number jumbling is sad and meaningless. For instance, you declare the Old Testament is three sets of 13. How did you get this? Oh, you divided the 39 books by three, ignoring the fact that the books are not three sets of 13 themselves. Anyone who knows the Torah is the first five books of the Old Testament will easily see how you are just working the numbers to meet your theory. You mention the 66 books of the Protestant Bible and somehow equate this to 666. Even though 66 is not 666, also 666 is the number of a man, not tied to any collection or canon of books. Apostle Paul wrote 13 books? That's an interesting claim for someone who claims the Bible is full of falsehoods. One would think you would advocate the theory that Paul was the author of only seven of his books, but then again, that wouldn't fit your attack on Apostle Paul and the Bible, now would it? Oh. And here's another one. You keep calling Paul the 13th apostle, but by my count, he was at least the 14th. In other words, you're attacking the Bible trying to connect Satan to it, and you're doing it with lies and deceit. Did you even realize this, Laverne? You try to make an issue out of different accounts of Paul's conversions, but they never contradict. They only highlight different details at different times. So what if Paul emphasizes Ananias to the Jews who would require a second witness, but not to Apriga who only needed to hear a summary of the account? You're manufacturing offenses where there are none. You can blame Paul acts differently depending on who he's with, but your argument against Paul is frivolous and shows a true lack of understanding to his teachings. He was teaching believers how not to be a useless witness, and you hate him for it. You would much rather have him be a pompous Jew, a Pharisee, as he once was in practice, than a loving witness of Christ. Remember, Paul didn't waver in his teachings. All he was doing was fitting in so he would be able to teach and preach. You complained because Paul said he was taught by Jesus according to his account. To that I say, so what? Why would Paul seek out the apostles if Jesus himself called him out to learn from him directly? If it were you, would you say, mm, hang on Jesus, uh, I need to go check with the apostles first. Comparing Paul to Simon in the homilies of Clement carries no weight with me at all. And it shouldn't carry weight with anybody else once they realize what a forgery that book is. You also claim that Paul had a superiority complex. Yet he declared himself the least of the apostles, despite being a strong leader with powerful teachings. You take offense to Paul using the phrase, my gospel, as opposed to the gospel of Christ. When Paul uses the phrase, my gospel, in my opinion, it was to identify the good news he was sharing as opposed to the false gospels or teachings rampant throughout the world concerning Christ. It wouldn't be enough to say the gospel of Jesus Christ if the false gospels were also claiming to be the gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, you're assuming an overly seeking fault in Paul. You attack wording because Paul said he tore down the law. You claim Paul is the only one making this claim, yet the council in Jerusalem did the very same thing in their pronouncement to the Gentiles. You say Paul taught opposite of Jesus and the apostles, but let's remember, Jesus said in John 16, verses 12 and 13, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear to hear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own initiative, but what he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. What was it that they couldn't yet bear to hear? I believe it's exactly what Paul was teaching. Of course, if Paul was teaching falsely concerning grace and forgiveness, so were the apostles, as testified in Acts 15, verses 7 through 11. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we are saved through grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they are also. Peter was referring to the law when he spoke of the yoke that they and their fathers could not bear. And he stated they say, and he stated that they were saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> James wrote, Therefore it's my judgment 
that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from what is strangled and from blood. For Moses from ancient generations has in every city those who preach him. For Moses from ancient generations has in every city those who preach him, since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Peter and James were not pushing the Mosaic law on the Gentiles at all. So by your logic, all apostles were teaching contrary to what Jesus taught. I guess the old wine and new wineskin thing means nothing to you. While James determined that they should avoid food sacrificed to idols, which Paul later opposed in principle, the bottom line is Paul and the apostles were in agreement where you say they weren't. I understand many saw the epistle of James as being against Paul, such as Martin Luther, but I believe that was their own ignorance. See, I believe when James wrote faith without works is dead, he wasn't opposing Paul, but instead he was opposing those who were misusing what Paul said. After all, if James was opposing Paul, he surely would have spoken against Paul by name. The apostles would not have silently sat by and let him go unchecked. When James spoke of the royal law or the king's law, he was writing about the law of the scriptures as revealed to the apostles by Jesus Christ. This is the same way Paul was teaching that this is the same way that Paul was teaching that those who belong to Christ fulfill the spirit of the law and that only happens because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We also claim Paul was false because Jesus said if someone says they saw him in the desert, don't believe them. But you're twisting what was actually said. Let's review it. Matthew 24, 22 through 26. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. So if anyone tells you, there he is out in the wilderness, do not go out. Or, here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. So let's break this down. Jesus said, at that time, meaning the end times. And despite what many early Christians thought, we know that Paul's times were not the end times at all. So this wasn't applicable to Paul's time in the wilderness with Christ. Apostle Paul didn't ask anyone to go out into the wilderness because Jesus was there. He said that was where Jesus taught him. Big difference. Now you make a big issue of Paul's first stop being to the house of Judas, trying to tie it into Judas Iscariot. But this is yet another assumption of yours, Laverne. Jesus also had a brother named Judas, not to mention Judas, the son of James. Your suspicious and convicting mind against Paul automatically assumes the worst. It is not a red flag unless you wish to make it one. You attack Paul as a Pharisee. Pharisee and their yeast. You attack Paul as a Roman, the beast. And you attack Paul because he's from the tribe of Benjamin, the wolf. Claiming these are markers against Paul. Essentially, you claim a man's past condemns him, denying the saving grace of Jesus Christ. The fact that Paul was a Pharisee, a Roman, and a descendant of the tribe of Benjamin has nothing to do with what Christ turned him into, which is an amazing evangelist. In fact, before his conversion, Paul was every bit the bad man, persecuting the Christians, but you dismiss his conversion and ignore the changes Christ made in Paul and continue to attack him as if he had not died to his former self. It's sickening how distorted you paint the picture. So let's break this down for a second. Did Paul refer to himself as a Pharisee? Absolutely, and according to him, he was a very well-respected Pharisee. But did Paul teach as the Pharisees taught? No. You quote Acts 23.6 as evidence against Paul, where he declares he is a Pharisee. But Paul was using the principle Jesus taught to divide the Jews who wanted him dead by appealing to the Pharisees in the group as a Pharisee himself, thus dividing them from the Sadducees. This was being gentle as a dove, but wise as a snake. You declare Paul's Roman citizen ties him to Rome, one of the beasts in prophecy. So I suppose every Roman is to be discarded? Would it interest you to learn that many believe Clement was a Roman as well? Hmm. Finally, you attack Paul for being from the tribe of Benjamin. Yet this is the same topic you and I crossed paths on the last time we danced this dance, and the fact is you are using a translation that differs from other translations available. The Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs is another fraudulent pseudographical. As a point of interest for the viewers, Laverne has his hands on a translation of the book that would ultimately condemn Apostle Paul, but if you go to the address on the screen, you'll read a version that actually supports Paul, though it is fraudulent. In that account, it actually prophesies that Paul will rise up and it says that he'll be um, inscribed in the holy books and, and that he shall be a chosen one of God forever. 
Hmm. It also says that he shall fill up that which the tribe of Benjamin lacks. Laverne tried pushing his copy on me once, and I think his book lacked the text which would actually vindicate Apostle Paul, but this is why I stopped entertaining his insanities until he sent me the current video in question. But let's turn our attention back to what you said, Laverne. You say you believe that Jesus was speaking of the tribe of Benjamin, even Paul himself, when he spoke of false prophets being wolves in Matthew 7. You declare that Jesus is actually identifying one particular wolf as if Jesus would not say, beware of one particular wolf. You not only ignored the words of Jesus, you changed them to meet your perversion. In Matthew 7, Jesus stated, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Notice the statement is plural. He goes on to say you will know them by their fruits. Keep in mind, Paul is not a they. Your false teaching is perverting and twisting what was written so that you can meet your perverted goals. Repent, man. Repent. You complain that Paul called himself a spiritual father in the NLT version, 1 Corinthians 4.15. Now, we certainly should look deeper into this, since it would be a serious offense if this is what Paul was saying, is Jesus said, call no man father, but because your father is the one in heaven. In fact, it's written in the King James Version like this, For though ye have ten thousand instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers? For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Hmm. Well, what of this Greek word being translated as father in the NLT that you love so much? In the King James it says, Yet ye not many fathers. That word is uh, potter, which is father in Greek. But where the NLT has Paul calling himself their spiritual father, the King James says, I have begotten you through the gospel. Giano. Now, Giano, according to the Strong's Concordance, has a few meanings, but I want to look at one specific definition of the word to engender, to arise, excite, in the Jewish sense of one who brings others over to his way of life to convert someone. Now that makes much more sense than Paul calling himself their spiritual father. I think it's odd how you do not seek answers more deeply on these issues, yet you will run to a pseudographical account, which is worthless. Again you pull out the NLT with Philemon 119, which says, Philemon owes Paul his very soul. Yet the King James Version, the NASB, and others say he owes him his very self. No doubt appealing to the fact that it was Paul who led him to Christ. You are deceived and deceiving because Paul never ever wrote anyone owed him their soul. You're following a watered down translation, Laverne. By the way, keep in mind, Paul taught that grace wasn't a license to sin, but men have ignored that. Paul teaches that we are to die to our former selves, our sinful nature, but you can't seem to hear that. You call the path difficult, yet Jesus said his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Yet you don't heed this. Yes, the path is narrow, but it's narrow because few will accept it, not because it's difficult. You see, you see a very different gospel, and it's you who will have to answer for your lack of faith. You see two messiahs? I say you never understood the first, so you had to create a second to explain your deficiencies in understanding Jesus. You complain that Paul said people ought not marry, but even Jesus said some are born eunuchs, some are made eunuchs, and some choose to be eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. In other words, people ought not marry if they can accept it. You declare that Paul is the man of mockery mentioned in the Damascus document, yet the Damascus document isn't even a Christian document. It's something written by Jews who rejected the formal form of Judaism. You claim Satan has convinced Christians not to read books outside the Protestant Bible, and you've even come up with a really neat formula where you take the time of a jubilee instead of a year, and I don't know how you came to that, but you do this to declare that the written word of God was protected until about 205 AD. Ironically, the homilies of Clement were written after 205 AD, and they are false, thus indicating Satan was trying to corrupt the hearts and minds of believers with these forgeries, if you're correct. Again, you reference the homilies of Clement to claim Peter warned that Satan said he'd be sending out his own apostles, but again, the homilies are forgeries. Jesus warned of false prophets that would come. There's no need to appeal to a forgery to try to make a point. You, uh, you state that the Damascus document said Jewish leaders looked for loopholes in the law, but then you say Jesus was referring to the Damascus documents, or at least their teachings in Matthew 12. I'm going to go ahead and read the passage. Then Jesus went over to their synagogue, where he noticed a man 
with a deformed hand. The Pharisees asked Jesus, does the law permit a person to work by healing on the Sabbath? They were hoping he would say yes so they could bring charges against him. He answered, if you had a sheep that fell into a well on the Sabbath, wouldn't you work to pull it out? Of course you would. And how much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Yes, the law permits a person to do good on the Sabbath. You see, Jesus wasn't referring to the Damascus document. He was saying, who are they to protest his miracles on the Sabbath when they would save an animal from a well on the Sabbath? This is just another stretch of yours. The, the context of the scripture defines what this is about. You assume this is proof that he's referencing the Damascus document when the reasoning for the statement is given in the scripture. The point is that we can do good on the Sabbath. You use this as another excuse to slander Paul, but all you're doing is exposing yourself, Laverne. You proclaim Paul has rotten fruit through insults and attacks against other apostles. You insist Paul doesn't walk the walk, pointing to the trouble that he had with Mark. But you have no idea what that trouble was. All the passage says is Mark abandoned them. Maybe Mark refused to stand for Jesus, showing shame in Christ. But you don't know anything about the matter any more than anyone else does, other than what was written. More assumptions on your behalf, Laverne. Also, you claim that Mark was an apostle. I wonder where that's documented. And for that matter, how do you know that this was the Mark that wrote the Gospels of Mark? More assumptions? I think so. You also criticized Paul's account of the incident with Peter and said that he ought not have written about it, you know, where he called Peter a hypocrite. But I disagree completely as Paul was teaching about and against Peter's hypocrisy and how Peter's shame and the truth led Barnabas astray as well. Paul was exposing this danger and you have no idea if in reconciling Peter might have said, yeah, Use this incident to warn and teach others. More assumptions and judgments from you, Laverne. You again appeal to the homilies of Clement, and you use it to claim Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles who weren't water baptized. More forgery and foolishness. For one, nowhere can I find an occasion where Peter or any other apostle insisted anyone confessing Christ fast for a day before baptism. It's sheer garbage from the forgery. In Acts 10, we see three men come to Peter's house, and he offered them lodging. These were unbaptized Gentiles invited into his home and surely fed under the rules of hospitality. Wake up, man. You claim Paul is connected to the false prophetess uh, from Thautara out of Revelation. You try to link Paul to the prophetess, but it falls short completely. Jesus said she was committing adultery and uh, encouraging people to eat food sacrificed to idols. He was pointing out a wicked culture led by a false prophetess. You know, Paul baptized Lydia from Thotara and assumed Lydia is Jezebel. Anything is possible, but you're making another huge assumption here. You claim Paul taught that, that it was okay to eat food sacrificed to idols, but what Paul was saying was, it doesn't matter one way or the other because we are under one God. Jesus also taught that it's not what we eat that makes us unclean, but what we speak. I guess you don't see the unity in these teachings, but I sure do. Now, to be clear here, Paul also taught against adultery, but you claim Paul taught that those who had unbelieving spouses could remarry, thus become adulterers. 1 Corinthians 7 says, Yet if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under the bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. His teaching was that the believer wasn't bound to following the unbeliever into the world. He didn't teach that they could remarry, and thus committing adultery. You added that part. Jesus wasn't claiming that the teaching came from Paul in Revelation. He didn't claim that Paul trained Jezebel. That also comes from you. You claim Paul actually baptized the false prophetess, but you have no evidence of that at all. Paul never taught or encouraged adultery, and he wasn't teaching people that it was okay to eat from idols. He was teaching why it really didn't matter. He also taught that if it offends your brother, don't do it. See, you're like one Peter described when he endorsed Apostle Paul. You were twisting what he wrote, and the rest of the scriptures as well. Your understanding of Paul's teachings on marriage are severely lacking. You attack Paul's teachings on sin. So let me clear something up for you. You get upset when Paul appeals to tradition, and you get upset when Paul states that women should be silent as it is with the law, as if he ought never reference the law. Yet Paul taught the law teaches us what sin is. Romans 7.7, 7. what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetedness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. You see, Laverne, you're just stubbornly attacking Apostle Paul. FYI, Paul was teaching that women ought not to blurt out questions in church. 
if everything was as it should be, she would go to her husband, who in turn should go to the pastor if he doesn't know the answers. Ultimately, God will supply the answers if you have faith and ask him, just as James taught. Now, while I agree the gospel according to Thomas is inspired, you show a terrible bias and lack of understanding in trying to use it against Apostle Paul. You noted that in verse 114, Jesus said he would make Mary Magdalene like a man so that she could get into heaven. But he was talking about this spiritually. He wasn't talking about physically changing Mary into a man, okay? Um, you then declare that Paul hated women and thus he taught different. Yet Paul taught the same exact thing when he taught that there is no difference between a Jew or a Gentile, a man or a woman in Christ Jesus. It's the same teaching. It's a spiritual teaching. It's about teaching that... Uh, Jesus sees us all the same. Now, you attack Paul again because he said sin came through Adam. Well, it did. But Eve was the first deceived. I believe you also made an incorrect assumption when you said, uh, I think it was you who said 1 Timothy chapter 2 uh, claimed that Paul says women will be saved through childbearing. But the passage isn't speaking of spiritual salvation. Instead, it speaks of being saved from the temptations and deceptions of Satan if she doesn't refuse her place as God had set things, just as Eve would have been able to withstand Satan had she followed what Adam had said, had she not left her assignment. Um, the passage actually reads, But women will be preserved to childbearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Again, this passage refers to preservation from Satan and his attacks against women if they adhere to their God-given roles. Where this order is broken, Satan is given the opportunity to attack the husband and the wife. And we've seen this throughout society and throughout history. Um, as women have left their assigned role that God gave them, society has gone down the tubes. Now, it's not women's fault per se. It's also men's fault too, but it's just indicative of the problems that come from that. Uh, finally, I want to talk about how you declare that uh, God will break his covenant with the church as prophesied in Zechariah. Zechariah 11 is speaking of all the people of Israel and Judah and breaking the Mosaic covenant that they had. Your translation may say all nations or nations, but the actual prophecy is not about breaking the new covenant. Many translations say the people because it's referring to those of Judah and Israel. Think about this a second. We already know that the path is narrow and few would find it. So why would God bother destroying this covenant? Why would he break it when he already knows that only a few are going to find it? Think about that. Now in closing, I'd like to say if you really want to see what a false prophet who teaches opposite of Christ, um, if you really want to see how he would encourage a sinful life and call it holy, I suggest you investigate the false prophet Muhammad from the Islamic religion. Jesus warned us not to judge, lest we be judged by the same measure. Thus, when you cast out your broad accusations against Apostle Paul, declaring him to be a false prophet of Satan, I believe it's required that we examine you and your motives as well. And we have to do it by the same measure. Please know this isn't how I want to deal with you, Laverne, but this is how I'm led to deal with you. I dismissed your ridiculous opinions on Apostle Paul months and months ago, but you insist on drawing me back into this. So I say, look at your life. You are alone, without fellowship, always accusing others of falsehoods, always looking outside the Bible to feed your love of accusing others, willing to accept almost any writing without any regard to who wrote it, when they wrote it, and why it's there. And despite your supposed humbleness, you are like the very wolves that Jesus warns us about. I'm praying for your deliverance from these twisted beliefs, Laverne. But I have to tell you, this is the last video I'm going to make to you on this topic. So until next time. Happy Jesus Day. God bless and peace out.